Isn't it lovely to have some of these gems of our choir singing and to be able to see portions of our sanctuary and Jeff at our beautiful piano. And to hear Don Morgan's deep, deep bass voice. During the season of Lent, we will be considering the gifts of the dark woods and the experiences of those times in life when God can feel far away. Times of feeling lost, uncertainty, when life just seems to drop out beneath us and ultimately finding God, discovering God in places we might not imagine. These are often places that we don't want to go initially, but often they are places that can give us powerful revelations about who God is and who God is calling us to be. Engaging meaningfully and being receptive to the promptings of the Holy Spirit may just reveal your path through the dark wood this Lent. Today, we, lift, we look at the gift of temptation. Most of us don't think of temptation as a gift, but Eric Elmas spells out in this book, Gifts of the Dark Wood, that there are gifts in all of these places, if we can see it. The challenge posed by this gift is so formidable, formidable that even Jesus struggled with it. When Jesus is baptized, you remember back in January, the first Sunday after the season of Christmas, we were at the River Jordan and we heard the voice of God voicing pleasure in Jesus. You are my son in whom I am well pleased. And Jesus receives a new identity, a new name when God says, you are my beloved. You are God's beloved. And this is the name that God desires us to have as well. Remember who you are. You and you and you and you and you. You are God's beloved. Go and love the world. After receiving this name and God's affirmation, Jesus was filled up with the Spirit and he was led out by the Spirit into the wilderness for 40 days where he fasted and where he discerned his call, preparing his heart and soul for what God wanted him to do. He spent time discerning what this naming as God's beloved and this claiming event meant for his life. In the midst of this, he was tempted by Satan or in Hebrew, the adversary. And it's good for us to be thinking, what is our adversary? Not in the way that I did when I was a kid and I got into mischief and may not have chosen the right path all the time. And out of my mouth, I don't know where it came from. The devil made me do it. Anyone ever try that line before? The devil made me do it. But in our grown-up versions, as maturity sets in, there are various adversaries in our life. And it's good to wrestle with those adversaries. Jesus is not tempted by bad things. He's tempted by goodness, by good things. And for him, it's a version of being in the dark wood. Some people focus on how temptation in our lives is bad, that it's a battle of good versus evil. In a nutshell, people might say, Satan tempts, Jesus refutes, temptation is bad, be like Jesus. Okay, that's the formula. Pretty easy, just stick to that and you're good. Except it's more complicated than, like, than that. Because Jesus is presented not with good versus evil. He's presented with a series of alternatives, which all seem to be good, seem to be good things. Turning stones into bread, he was famished. He'd been fasting 
it wouldn't only satisfy his hunger pangs, it could also eradicate world hunger. Jesus refused, stating that humans do not live by bread alone, but by word, every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. We heard that song, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and God's righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Jesus refutes, saying we are not fed by bread alone. Next, the adversary showed Jesus all of the cities and the kingdoms of the world, claiming that they could be his if only Jesus just bowed down to worship him. Oh, the opportunity to wield political power holds tremendous potential for doing good, depending on who the leader is. But we could imagine that Jesus would be an amazing ruler. He could change oppressive laws by executive decree, direct resources for their best use, bring an end to war and violence, usher in an age of peace and justice. I'm telling on my brother, Kevin, but he couldn't figure out who to vote for in the 2016 election. So do you know, he had a write-in candidate. You know whose name he put? Literally, he wrote in the name, Jesus. And some of us would agree, Jesus would probably make a fine president. Although he would probably have adversaries being president as well. But Jesus rejects political power, declaring that we are here to worship God alone. Finally, Jesus is tempted with religious authority. The adversary took Jesus to the highest point of the Jerusalem temple, challenging him to jump off and let the angels save him. Those who doubted God or who had no faith would all of a sudden believe in God. But Jesus says, don't test the Lord your God. At this point, the adversary is defeated and he leaves Jesus awaiting the next opportunity. There are lots of interpretations of these temptations, but no, no matter how we interpret them, they're complicated because they hold the possibility for doing good. Jesus isn't asked to do anything shameful. He is not asked to commit the seven deadly sins, although he is asked to go against one of the commandments, thou shalt have no other gods before me. That would be a bad one. He's not being asked to rob a bank, lie under oath, or commit murder. United Methodist pastor Lisa Kane of Athens, Georgia wrote, he is being tempted to potential greatness at the point of what is reasonable, helpful, and good. He's not being tempted to fall or fail. He is being tempted to rise and succeed. He isn't being tempted to do something he cannot do, but something he can do. He isn't being tempted to misbehave. He is being tempted to forget his core identity who he was named at his baptism, all in pursuit of doing good things. As we read the gospels, we will see that over the course of his ministry, Jesus will feed the hungry. Jesus will perform miraculous healings. He will change the political and religious equation, confronting powerful people in places of authority, but he does not become a baker, he does not become a physician, and he does not become an activist like the zealots. And he isn't going to do any of these things in the way that Satan desires his adversary in a kind of superhuman way. Jesus' way is through vulnerable love and through empowering others. While these activities were part of his path, to devote his life to any one of them would have been less than what he was called to do. These aren't the things to which Jesus has been called to devote all of his time and energy. They were not bad things. 
And so that's where we need to realize that there is a difference between doing good and the specific good to which we are each called to do. It simply wasn't Jesus's good thing to do in that moment or in that way. And that is the tension and the temptation for us as well. What is our good thing to do in this life, in this moment? There is a quote attributed to you, the inadvertent founder of Methodism, John Wesley, although scholars cannot find these words in any of his writings, but it is a well-known quote and it has been inscribed on my being for a few decades now. Perhaps you know it. Do all the good you can in all the ways you can to all the souls you can in every place you can at all the times you can with all the zeal you can at all the times you can. Whoops, I repeated myself. Maybe it's good to repeat every once in a while. As long as you ever can. I think most of us in this life of faith try to live up to the high bar of these words of doing all the good we can to all the people we can at all the times we ever can. And it can be exhausting. It can also be inspiring. But contrast these words that have been attributed to John Wesley with the well-known with the well-known poem Wild Geese by Mary Oliver. Do you know how that poem starts? You do not have to be good. What? These words attributed to John Wesley says, do all the good you can. Mary Oliver writes in Wild Geese, you do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Tell me about your despair and I will tell you mine. Meanwhile, the world goes on. Meanwhile, the sun and the clear pebbles of the rain are moving across the landscape over the prairies and the deep trees, the mountains and the rivers. Meanwhile, the wild geese high in the clean blue air are heading home again. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination, calls to you like wild geese, harsh and exciting over and over announcing your place in the family of things. What a tension there is between these two understandings of what it means to be good. What happens when you hear these different set of words? How, how do these words land on you? Have you ever followed somebody else's idea of what it means to be good? Instead of listening for God's naming and claiming event on your life, the one where you hear the voice of God calling you God's beloved. It almost sounds blasphemous as a person of faith to be told by Mary Oliver in this poem, God Rest Her Soul. You do not have to be good. But there may also be a sense of release as we realize that we can release the burden we carry of having to do enough good in the world. Is there ever enough good that can be done? And can any one of us perform enough good? And then we hear Mary Oliver's voice in, in our ear. You don't have to be good. A friend and colleague, UCC pastor, who is a former pastor of University Congregational UCC, Reverend Peter Ilgenfritz, he preached on this text and said, goodness can keep us trapped into doing what other people think we ought to be doing, living someone else's life. 
Goodness can keep us from having the authentic conversations we need to have. And one of the conversations we need to have is about race. And he goes on, one of the things I've learned along my stumbling way and talking about issues of race is that the biggest thing that keeps me from an authentic conversation about race is my own goodness. What does he mean by that? It keeps me from the work of transformation. A good person could never have any racist thoughts, could they? A good person could never say things or not say things that others interpret as racist. Good people do not do that. So instead of moving into those difficult conversations, Peter says, walls go up, we get defensive, we back away from the dark woods and we choose not to go there because we are good people. And he talks about DJ radio host, Jay Smooth, who said, we have to put down the binary of good and bad people. It doesn't help us, it keeps us from the conversation. Instead, we have to pick up goodness and say, good people look at their imperfections, except that being a good person is not about being perfect. When I can put that down and the protection of goodness, I'm open, more open to a real conversation where I can really hear from other people about my mistakes, my learning, my opening. I don't have to hold that high mantle of goodness. In a sense, we can claim that we are all ordinary, complex beings with faults, broken, and that we are called beloved children of God. Reverend Stephen Garnis Holmes, whom I frequently quote, and he is the one who wrote another spirit song that we use frequently in our worship. He wrote this week, he is newly retired these last eight months. He wrote on his um, internet page, unfoldinglight.net, and he will send you a daily email if you want it. You can, be, you can be added to his list. And he wrote this week, there are days we think, what a waste, I didn't get anything done today, or I haven't done anything useful with my life as if we are workers on a factory line or peasants serving an overlord. When you feel that way, ask yourself, if you haven't done what you needed to do, maybe even simply swept the floor or kept yourself alive, it may be you are avoiding what you're really called to do, to be honest with yourself. Or consider this, if you have wasted precious time. Perhaps you needed a Sabbath, which is rest from being productive. Give yourself that gift. God does. Really, the question is not what we produced or accomplished, but the real work of life is this. When did I wonder today? What did I notice? What grace did I receive? How grateful was I? How did I praise? How did I love? That reflection from Reverend Stephen Garnis Holmes from unfoldinglight.net. And then there is this from St. Francis of Assisi. I have done what, it, what was mine to do. May Christ teach you what is yours. In the dark woods, we can sort through what we want to keep in our lives and how we can make our pack a little bit 
lighter as we travel, as we release things, get, get rid of things that we've been carrying perhaps for a really long time, release some things to create more room, more spaciousness for something that really might matter in our lives. Perhaps we can put down that heavy mantle of goodness or our too high standards of goodness and we can pick up another name the name that God gave Jesus, the name that God wants to give us to, beloved child of God. And we might hear Mary Oliver whispering in our ear, you do not have to be good. Contemplative Thomas Merton wrote, the rush and pressure of modern life are a form, perhaps the most common form of its innate violence. To allow oneself to be carried away by a multitude of conflicting concerns, to surrender to too many demands, to commit oneself to too many projects, to want to help everyone in everything is to succumb to violence. More than that, it is cooperation with violence. The frenzy of the activist destroys his own inner capacity for peace. It destroys the fruitfulness of his work because it kills the root of inner wisdom which makes fruit work fruitful. Those words from Thomas Merton. The temptation then is to destroy our inner capacity for peace. When we say yes to too many good things, it is a spiritual discipline to know one's limits. It feels humbling to say, this is all I can lovingly, wisely do. And so people of God, people of United Church and University Place, if your pastor ever comes to you, inviting you to take on one more thing, that is where the wrestling begins. It may be exactly the thing that is calling your name. Or you may simply say, no pastor, this is all I can lovingly, wisely do. This is not my good work to do. Good luck finding somebody else and then pray for me and pray for the church. <laughs> Did I really just say all of that to all of you? <laughs> In this chapter on temptation, Eric Elmas wrote, Jesus offers something bigger than being good. Goodness keeps us from being all we are meant to be. It can fill us with shame and guilt because we can't possibly live up to the high standards. Jesus is not calling us to be good, but calling us to another name. The spirit beckons us not to be good, but to be human, fully human, humble of the word hummus, humus, which ultimately means finding your elemental waters, which are connected to God and living into your fullest energies. You can and will do a lot of good by walking the path that brings you most fully alive in this world. But in order to stay on this path, you must learn to say no to doing a great many good things. What is mine to do? What is yours? Let us do that. Let us do it well and do it with all the love that God has given. And let the rest go. May it be so. Amen. Our prayer hymn is new to me and most likely new to you as well. I found it and asked Jeff if he would record this for us. It is um, sung to a lovely tune with beautiful words that um, work well uh, for this first Sunday of Lent. Let's learn a new song written by Thew, T-H-E-W, Thew Elliot. <laughs> 